Hello, amazing humans. What an honor it is to have you listening in today. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode, episode number 179 with Comedy Wood. My friends, I am so looking forward to you hearing from today's guest. Comedy is the creator of Authentic Me, and she is the CEO of Live Joy Your Way, a coaching company helping teens, high achieving adults, models, actors, professional dancers, athletes, and ambitious individuals shake free of their fears, unhelpful mindsets, and behaviors in order to have healthy relationships and move forward on the professional path they choose. Kamini herself has gone from a people-pleasing perfectionist holding herself back by playing small into someone who recognizes her worth and sees that by embracing it, she can create room for others to do the same. Kamini is a mother of five who is a professional, she's one who is a professional ballerina and another who is a division one athlete. You guys, I am so looking forward to hearing Kamini's wisdom and insight today around a variety of topics that I am sure many of us will be able to relate to. So with that, Kamini, welcome to the Girls for Greatness podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited yes. for this conversation. Me too. <laughs> me too. So I wanted to start off by just having you tell us a little bit about your story, your personal story as to how you got into your coaching business, how that even evolved what you started out doing, how that transitioned, because I know there's been different transitions that you've obviously experienced. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about that whole journey. Sure. So um, I never envisioned that this would be what I was doing um, growing up. Um, well, I take that back. At the age of seven, I wanted to be a, psychi a psychiatrist, actually. I wanted to, to talk to people um, and help them with their problems. That's what I wanted mm. to do as a seven-year-old. However, um, you know, went through the traditional pathways and really what I ended up doing was, um, I worked in the dot-com industry as a project mm. manager, but as the, uh, so I ran actually the project office for one of the major dot-coms at the time. And the part that I absolutely loved was, um, not just the, the time management and the project management portion of it, but the resource management. And what that meant was, talking to the people on the team and figuring out what they needed and how I could mm. support them. Mm. I did that for several years until of course the dot-com industry kind of blew up <laughs> and I ended up um, actually sure. running my husband's law practice for about 15 years. And in that realm, again, wore many different hats, but the hat that I loved the most was working with individuals. Again, the different employees that we had trying to figure out what they wanted to do, mm -hmm. how they, how they wanted to move themselves forward, not just career wise, but also personally. Um, one of the paralegals that actually worked there, I, um, you know, talked her through as she got married and as she started a family. And those were the things I really loved. Now that was the professional side of it. Now we got to look at the personal side of it. You know, I am the daughter of immigrant parents. I grew up in a predominantly white town, uh, in Connecticut. And so, uh, definitely stuck out. My that was darker than the rest of the kids. I had a name like comedy, so that stuck out. And so when I was younger, I wanted to belong. There was this need mm -hmm. and desire to belong like many of us have. And so that's where a lot of my people pleasing started where mm -hmm. it was, and again, didn't know this at the time, but five, six year old me was trying to figure out how to belong in this group of individuals. And so when people were happy and I was giving them what they wanted or what I what I felt that they needed and just making sure that they were okay with me. I had this sense of belonging. That's where the, the idea sure. of, and the false belief came from. So that's how I kind of operated through my childhood and into adulthood. Also adding in the perfectionism, you know, as the child of immigrant parents who were working really hard to provide for my sister and I, I did not want to be a burden. And so the way that I internalized that as a young girl, again, was don't make mistakes. Don't mess anything up. And if you do, if you make sure that you aren't messing up, then you're not a burden to your parents. They don't have to worry about you. And so now you add in the perfectionism and that I carried through from a personal perspective, again, into adulthood, became a mom. And I'd say that my, mm. my children are my greatest teachers that I have ever had mm. and will have. Um, and I stand by that. And I started seeing in my kids, the mirroring of not just the perfectionism, but the people pleasing. And it was the people pleasing that really turned the tide for me where I realized I needed I needed to do my own self-work because they were getting that from me. I could see it. It was like a mirror. And that mirror allowed me, that reflection allowed me the room to start to identify that 
if I were able to own that and shift that and show up in a different way, I could then help my children shift it as well. Um, And so I went through my own personal work and my own personal journey Mm -hmm. with that. So you take this professional, um, you know, just the professional atmosphere and what I was enjoying doing, you go through this self-transformation. And that's when I realized that that's really what I was meant to do. So seven-year-old me who wanted to work Mm -hmm. with people one-on-one had the idea, right. Maybe not psychiatry, but for me, it's about sure holding that space for people to recognize that there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that the ways that they might be interpreting it or beliefs that they've been operating with are the things that might be keeping them stagnant or stuck. And if we could just shift those around a little bit, they absolutely can propel themselves forward. And here we are today. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, That's great. Uh, And I I think many of us as women can relate to that whole perfectionist mentality, whether you grew up, you know, feeling that way, I'm much like you felt the same, um, you know, high achiever, uh, you know, was praised for all of that. Um, and whether, you know, you may be listening and may not may think like, okay, well, maybe that wasn't me. I still think as women, we have so many things thrown at us, um, so many hats we wear, so many roles that we play, um, you know, whether we're a parent or not, or, you know, it's our career or whatever it is that mm-hmm. that perfectionism, uh, you know, how can we not um, put glom onto that a bit when, you know, we're so bombarded with it through, through our world, through media, through all of it. Um, I'm curious for you, what was maybe, uh, I guess one of the more difficult pieces for you to get over in that realm, even if it, even if it relates to maybe the whole idea of not being enough or not, you know, understanding that whole concept of, yes, I am enough versus I've always felt like I'm not enough if I don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, what would you say to that? My, I think that the hardest part for me was <clears throat> letting go of that. The idea that my worth comes from doing and making sure other people are, are okay and happy. Right. I was very attached to the belief that that that's where my worthiness came from. So if I didn't have that, then what did that mean? Sure. And that's really where I had to do a lot of deeper work, which to realize that my worthiness, and this is what I share with my clients all the time, is our worthiness doesn't come from an external place. It's it's all intrinsic. Our worthiness is by our own, our mere essence, our mere essence of our existence, our spirit, soul, whatever word you want to use already allows you to be worthy. And I think that's where sometimes the whole, I need to fix this, or I need to fix myself. We start taking on that um, idea pattern. And I really hold strongly that we're not broken, that we are whole and complete. We just might have lost traction or or, um, lost the ability to see it. And we just need support at times to realign and re-engage with those parts of ourselves. That's so true. That's a great way to put it, that we've lost our ability to, to see. And I've always kind of felt too, like, um, so much of what we search outside ourselves to fix is really there inside of us. It's just uncovering the layers and the history and all the other things that have piled us on top of us that we've, we've, uh, you know, kind of gotten lost in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot we could talk about on that topic. Um, (laughs) I'm curious, uh, I guess how you, um, and one of the things I had written down is how you kind of help the women you work with out of maybe a negative thought loop pattern, because I think that mm. plays into obviously feeling like we're not enough, um, feeling like if we don't get something perfect or we don't get something right, or we mm-hmm. don't do it right, or we don't look right quote unquote, Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. you know, we're, uh, we're not enough. We're not measuring up. We're not doing enough. So how do you address that? Well, the thing that I will routinely say to people I work with, and I've said it on, you know, interviews before is awareness is the doorway to change, right? So the very first thing that we start working with it and, and we do it in a very sensitive way, um, you know, cause here's the thing, a lot of us who have, those belief patterns. Sometimes it is just from experiences and messages, but others of us have actually learned that or 
started to believe it through a trauma. So we have to be very careful with how we go about it, but Mm -hmm. it is about bringing to the awareness where that story comes from. Um, Because once we're aware, we now are at this place of it's a choice point. And we actually have autonomy at that place as to whether or not we're going to continue with that or we're going to release it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not to say that I I don't only work cognitively because if we think about it, the subconscious beliefs are not not just held by our brain. They're also held by our body right? because we've internalized them. So the way that I really work with my clients is a combination of cognitive as well as somatic. Where are we holding some of that within our system? Mm. That's how we actually change the underlying. And it's it's coming to a place of deeper understanding of self. And Mm. as you have that, now you have the ability to change and shift some of those belief patterns and systems based on saying, okay, well, now that I'm aware of this story, like, so for instance, that I don't, I don't have the right clothes. So therefore I'm not good enough. It's not just that surface level story. It's about understanding from where does that originate? And what is that like beneath the, I don't have the right clothes to wear. We get down to the, I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not lovable. Whatever that true bottom line false right. belief is, bring that up to the surface. And now we work through it cognitively and somatically to shift into where what's actually true about you and what choices do you want to make in order to move yourself forward to write your own narrative, which we tend to do looking back at our core values and our core needs. Because when we look at our, our core values and needs, now we can start assessing what's actually true for us. Yeah, that's so true. That's great. And I, I would also think, you know, understanding too where those thoughts um where they originated from. I mean, like you said, the example with the clothes, I mean, yes, then going back layer by layer and saying, you know, well, that is then something that we've taken on about ourselves. Like I'm not this, I'm not that, but then also saying, you know, where and when did we start to adopt that thought pattern? Um, Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure, uh, you know, all of us have our things that we've struggled with and we can trace, I think something back to, you know, anything in, you know, in our, whether it was our childhood or our our upbringing or, you know, school experiences. Um, So, yeah, I think that's a really great point. That's a really great point um, that you make. Um, How do you think we become more of an observer of who we are and what we do and, you know, just all of it versus being, you know, judgmental? of ourselves, mm-hmm. which, oh my gosh, I mean, women do really well. I do it really well. <laughs> you know? I know I can do it really well too. Yeah. <laughs> the way that I often will talk about that very topic is it's about diffusion. It's, it's separating mm-hmm. ourselves from the thoughts, right? So the judgment is just yet another thought. So really being able to name and notice, notice and name how, whichever way you want to put it the thought that we're having, because the truth is we're going to have thousands of thoughts a day. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to decide which ones we put our energy into and actually want to continue to um, give our time and parts of ourselves. Right. So if we notice and name the thought that we're having, now we can have that moment of, you know, connection back to self and ask those questions of either, you know, what's true or even furthermore, what's meaningful to me? What would be a value to me? And is Mm. this, is this thought that I'm having actually helpful to me or not? Because like, for instance, with judgment, many times it's, um, there's a lot of comparison that's happening. Right. Normal. Right. And and a lot of people will say, stop comparing, stop comparing. Well, that's almost, almost, I'm not saying it is the same, but it's almost the saying stop breathing or stop thinking because there's the law of relativity, right? right? Natural law here. We compare most things like for instance, right. in the morning when we wake up, we're comparing, is it better to sleep in or better to get up and get the day started? True. So comparison is part of our life as a whole, but really it's, does this comparison serve me or not? Is it helpful or not? So that's just hmm. a way that we we can start diffusing. We separating ourselves from the thought. The thought's just the thought. I'm still here. Now, when we have that space, we're stepping into observer mode and we can ask those questions really with compassion and curiosity of, okay, what's happening for me here? What's serving me here? What's not serving me here? What's this part of me trying to tell me? All the the inquiring questions um, that allow us space to figure out what would be best for us in terms of moving ourselves forward. Sure. Sure. Oh, that's good. That's great. I like that. I like that recommendation too. 
Um, and I'm sure that kind of plays into as well uh, the whole idea of limiting beliefs and how uh, so often, you know, we let those judgments or we let those thought patterns or we let those whatever, you know, play into then what we truly adopt and start thinking about ourselves and what we're capable of and what we're worthy of. Um, just speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So with limiting beliefs, I think what ends up happening is we start, I mean, we take that as true. We we're fused to the idea that maybe that's the best that we can do or with imposter syndrome, for instance, it's mm -hmm. self-doubt. It's the, I, people are either going to figure out that it was a fluke. I'm a fake. I can't actually do this. I just, you know, this happened by mere luck. Those are all limiting beliefs and they keep us in a box. And so when we are faced with those, if again, if we can notice them and name them and separate ourselves from the thought, now we can actually either challenge it or get curious with what, what's that part. Cause sometimes with limiting beliefs, that part of us is trying to protect us from potential hurt. So I see this a lot in relationships where there's almost mm. a self-sabotage that happens mm. because the limiting belief is I can't really have love or I'm not lovable right? As the, the, mm. the bottom layer sure. false belief or limiting belief. And so then as a relationship evolves there, there's a self-sabotaging behavior, for instance, of either finding something wrong with that person that you're with, or um, maybe taking action that ends the relationship on it, like quicker mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. just, and it's a way that we protect ourselves from potential fallout. I would rather be the one who created this end to this relationship so that I know it's coming and therefore I'm not as hurt. That's again, right. subconscious thought, but it's all based in this false belief, limiting belief of I'm not lovable to begin with anyway. So that's mm -hmm. how those things, they, they end up playing havoc on us. But if we're able to bring them to the awareness and now we diffuse from them, separate, notice them, we can make choices for ourselves as to what and how we want to show sure. up and move forward. Sure. How, how do you personally comedy, like for yourself, even combat some of these things like judgment, um, you know, limiting belief, uh, feeling that, you know, you're not good enough or that you didn't do something, mm -hmm. you know, perfect. I mean, I always say this on, on here, you guys is, you know, we're all a work in progress, including myself. And just because, you know, I may say that I have worked on something doesn't mean that it goes away. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, I, you know, I think our abilities to cope and to navigate get better as we work on things, but it doesn't necessarily just get rid of it. Oh, hundred percent. I say that to my clients all the time that this is the, we, yeah. I love what you just said. We're a work in progress. I say that we're yeah. continually growing and evolving mm -hmm. and there's just another layer of it that we're learning about. Um, because truthfully, if we stopped growing and evolving, what's left to do. <laughs> right. So right. for me personally, I, I walk this walk that I'm coaching around as I'm doing the same thing. Mm. Cause this will come up routinely, like from motherhood, for example. I mean, there are moments after moments where I'll catch myself and I'm saying like, I've messed that up, or I don't know if I've made the right decision. And again, it, it is the work that we do. It's not making it go away. It's about shortening the time between that trigger point and coming back to center. And so mm. for me, it is, mm. I utilize a lot of what I talk about in terms of, oh, wow, there's the thought again that I'm this, you know, I'm a terrible mom. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I remind myself about certain things that are true, which is, yeah, I don't actually have a manual for this. I've never experienced this before. And I'm making the best decision that I can in this moment right now. And we'll see how this turns out. And no matter how it turns out, I'm going to then make the next best decision. So it's a lot of self-talk too, where we have to recognize and notice when we're having those negative thoughts and the negative mm. self-talk, which mm. is really important and not make ourselves bad or wrong for the negative self-talk. But instead, as we notice it, allow ourselves room to, to shift it in that moment to, again, and I'm not talking about positive, uh, toxic positivity where we're, we have a negative thought. We immediately go to the positive right. thought. It's what's an accessible thought that also can be true right now. Right. So mm. yes, like for instance, with the, my example, right. Yes. You have no idea what you're doing right now. And you are the, the thought that I generally will shift to is, and you're making the best choice with what's in front of you right now. Mm. And that allows me room to continue moving forward rather mm. than spiral into, I'm a terrible mom who has no idea what she's doing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's great. It's really good. I love that. Um, how have you 
uh, I guess, taken what you've learned and the work you did on yourself and how did you then apply it to your relationship with your kids and parenting? Because I know you have very high performing children <laughs> and uh, I'm curious how you've how you've been able to maybe impart some of your wisdom um, because let's face it, I mean, <laughs> it's also, you know, uh, I think one of the things all of us is, as uh, moms want to be able to do is to help our kids also navigate uh, a world, especially where talk about bombardment of, mm. of, of, you know, the way it's supposed to be, our life is supposed to be, or how we're supposed to look or how we're supposed to act or what we're supposed to be doing even. I mean, how have you addressed that? Well, I will be honest. Um, one of the things that I really worked on was uh, really owning my emotions and communicating them and making room for my kids to do the same. Hmm. One of the things that I really have hmm. worked on and also have learned through just my trainings and practicing with individuals is our emotions are really data packets of information. And so often we tend to suppress our emotions thinking that either we don't have time for them or there's no room for them. And if we can give ourselves permission to feel our feelings and ask the questions of what is this emotion here to communicate to me, there's so much knowledge in mm. that, just that simple question. So that's one thing that I've definitely made room for in my relationship with my kids is mm. allowing myself to have emotions and, and sharing them as well as allowing them room to have theirs. Meaning when they have big emotions, I don't tell them to stop. Uh, mm -hmm. I tell them, tell me more. Um, the other part of it too, is when I do have my emotions or I have a reaction to something is really paying attention to what's happening for me. And is this more my narrative mm. rather than theirs? Mm. Because a lot of times as parents, yeah. we are unconsciously projecting our own stories onto our kids and Yes. By me doing the work and recognizing and slowing down and saying, okay, this is my story. Um, I can then again, separate my story from theirs and and shift into putting the focus back on what's happening for them instead of projecting my interpretation, my perception or what it is that I want for them. So for instance, a lot of people will make the joke of like, wow, you must've really pushed your kids to do, you know, a professional ballerina, mm. what is, I think it's like two, 2% or something of dancers mm. actually make it to wow. that level, whatever it may be, whatever it may be. Right. And the truth is I never once said to my daughter, you have to do this or mm -hmm. you should try mm -hmm. to look. When she said she wanted it, it was making room to ensure that that was something that she wanted. And still that it's, you know, there's a lot of stress that comes with that, that industry. And our conversations are always about making room for her emotions rather than my projections about my, my thoughts or opinions on, let's say the industry for, for example. Mm, mm. Um, so that's just some of how I've really tried to use what I've learned as well as just how I've, how I've shown up and, and created in terms of even my coaching practice and allowing that room with my kids as well. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. I really love that. Um, that's a really great tip uh, for all of us as parents. I sometimes feel like it just uh, so often comes down to us asking the questions and then shutting our mouths to listen, <laughs> which we <laughs> off, 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 often want to just jump in and say, you know, yep. and correct and guide. And um, no, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Allowing that space. Um, well, before I ask, the last couple of questions, tell us a little about maybe what you're up to now, what you're up to currently, and if there's anything on the horizon for you. Yeah. So, I mean, I am still, um, I'm running my one-to-one -one coaching practice. That's the main thing mm -hmm. that I do day in and day out. Uh, but I did just release a six week short course. Um, it's, I don't want to curse on your show, so I won't curse. No, you're stop fine. Treating your, <laughs> stop fine. treating yourself like shit. <laughs> like it. I love it. I love it. Uh, so it's a, it's a six week short course for those that might not either be ready or able to jump into the, the one-on-one -on -one coaching, mm. uh, which actually just got released this past week. So I'm kind of, I'm I'm actually kind of That's excited, excited about to see where that goes. For um, sure. And it, it just sort of walks you through small, it's just to jumpstart you, jumpstart you on your journey. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you guys, I will be sure to have obviously all that stuff in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. That was, those will all be linked. Um, so my last couple of questions that I ask every guest, um, tell me three words that best describe who you really and truly are. 
Ooh, okay. Um, empathetic. Uh, if this is hyphenated, highly sensitive. Okay. <laughs> like it, like it. <laughs> Me too. Um, I'm highly sensitive. <laughs> and I would say loving. That's awesome. Those are great words. Highly sensitive. Wow. I don't think anyone's ever said that. That's, that's really, I love that. Um, tell me, uh, one thing you are currently working on to improve in your own life. Uh, I am currently working on how to, um, allow myself to be seen more. Mm. Uh, I am definitely, I would say an extroverted introvert. So I'm still sure. trying to strengthen that extroverted part of who I am. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's great. Um, and then one thing that you are proud of yourself for being or doing. I am absolutely without a doubt, proud of myself. Can I say two? Can sure. Two? Sure. <laughs> of course. I'm proud of myself for showing up as a present mom. I really am. Mm. Uh, I, I've said that they've been my best teachers and um, that's just one thing that I'm absolutely proud of, of doing and being. Um, and the second is, is giving myself permission to lean into starting my coaching practice and um, following through with it instead of just the old narrative of stay behind the scenes. Stay behind the scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. No. Kamini, thank you so much for, for being here. I loved this conversation and I just love the work that you're doing. I think it's so important. You've shared so much great wisdom and insight on, you know, a lot of different topics that we kind of crammed in there, uh, into a, a short amount of time, but, uh, just love the work you're doing in the world and, and really commend you for that. And I know that, um, I'm sure that that's changing lives and, and touching a lot of people. So thank you. Thanks for being thank here. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me.